Next, we're going to talk about hacking wireless. We're going to discuss wireless attacks, identify methods to bypass MAC authentication, review detecting cloaked access points, and examine attacks against encrypted networks. Wireless acts as a bridge. You still have to get to the wired side. Traditional hacking that we've already covered still applies. Doesn't do you any good to get to the wireless access point and break into it if it's outside of the perimeter, then you have to do the wired side hacking. So always remember, even though you do wireless hacking, more than likely you're going to have to get some wired hacking in there too. Some wireless technologies for you. A lot of them out there. We're not going to go into each one of these. They're there for your reference. But the one we want to talk about, the 802.11i, we're best secure network architecture. This is our security, and this is mainly where we're at today. But wireless came out way before any of the protections really were ready for wireless. So because of that, we have some attacks and things we want to talk about because there's been attacks that wireless have had against it. This is the IEEE standards that set up the committee for 802.11n. Again, IEEE, Institute of Electrical Electronic Engineers, it sets up a committee and sets up a standard for a protocol. And they did this with wireless. Unfortunately, when they did it with wireless, they had a bunch of radio engineers set up the initial protocol for what we call 802.11, which is the wireless standard. And those radio engineers had to pick protocols that really, they really weren't that familiar with. So some of the threats of wireless, you have default settings. Almost everybody has set up a wireless access point at home. Well, those wireless access points come with a default setting. If you don't change that, that default setting is compromised. Rogue access points. This works by he who has the most power wins. That is, if I go into an organization and I put in an access point that's twice or three times more powerful than the access point that's real, most users come in and say, oh, look, five bars. They're going to attack to connect to the five bars, which is, in fact, the attacker. We've got sniffing and traffic analysis because it's in the wireless. Wireless is there. So as long as we've got a receiver in the air, we can intercept it. Then inter interference and denial of service. Wireless is wireless. So we can have interference. Anybody who's set up wireless knows a microwave oven. There's a lot of things. Your, your phones, your uh, cell phones, those types of things can all cause interference. So when we're doing attacks against wireless, we've got to make sure we don't actually flood the wireless and cause an actual denial of service. And the wireless frequency hopping, CDMA, and spread spectrum. Most of you don't know this, so that's why we've got a picture of her here. This is Hedy Lamarr. Hedy Lamarr is a famous Hollywood actress that in 1942, her and her husband, a composer, actually came up with the concept for frequency shift keying. And they did it because the story has it, they were at a USO show, and her husband and her were sitting with some soldiers, and they were talking about a problem with the Germans intercepting communications. So Hedy Lamarr looked at her husband and said, couldn't they use different chords like you do different chords in music and then it'd be harder to tell what the actual message was, which was left to different frequencies, which led to frequency shift keying. We didn't know this for many, many years because it was protected under classified documents. But in actually 1942, her and her husband were awarded the patent for frequency shift keying. Some of you out there probably never heard of her, but go look up the movie Samson and Delilah. She played Delilah, one of her famous roles. So wireless security, we had the SSID, the server set identifier, the wired equivalent privacy, WEP, a lot of you heard of WEP probably, Wi-Fi protected access, WPA, WPA, TKIP, temporal key integrity protocol, and AES, the advanced encryption standard, and we have war driving. So what we want to do is we want to go around using these different techniques to intercept the wireless signals. So WEP is a perfect example of why radio engineers should not be selecting cryptographic protocols. They selected a cipher called RC4 for the R in round revest. RC4 is a stream cipher. As you may recall, a stream cipher has the plain, same plain text size as the cipher text. So because of that, we can reverse engineer the key after a number of packets are received. Well, the radio engineers were smart enough to know that. So what they did is they put in a protection value for us. That protection is what we call the IV, the initialization vector or initialization value, depending on what text you read. It's not large enough for the key space. So a modern day computer, 24 bits, can go through it and in reality what happens in about five to, minute, five to 15 minutes of collection, in most cases, we can crack the web key because we get enough weak IVs and we can crack the key. 
It's better than no encryption, but it's not much better than no encryption. So again, understand these are things we have to look at when we attack. WEP is usually something we can attack. There's the WEP data showing you actually a packet and looking at the data in the 802. This is 802.11 traffic, which means the network card's in monitor mode because it's called promiscuous mode is monitor mode. Okay? We also have WPA PSK, which is pre-shared key. This was the interim fix for WEP. What that means is WEP was broken. We knew WEP was broken, but 802.11i and the robust secure network architecture was still a long time coming from coming out of committee. So in the interim, they came up with a fix for WEP and they called it WPA pre-shared key, PSK. It still used the RC4 algorithm, but instead of using the same key on every packet like was used in WEP, again a mistake by the radio engineers, it did per packet mixing and changed the key. Okay? Additionally, it increased the IV initialization vector to 48 bits. The IV being 48 bits made it much harder to crack the key and Remember, it used per packet mixing, so it changed the key on every packet. The problem with it was, it went from having this hexadecimal code like we had in WEP to a password or a passphrase. So now we left it up to the user to have a strong password or passphrase. So because of that, it's only as strong as what the user selects. So if it's a dictionary word, we can run dictionary attacks against it. So like anything else, we have to make sure we don't do that. And as I said, it uses TKIP. Temporal Key Integrity Protocol. There have been weaknesses in this, so be aware that TKIP is no longer recommended. This is what it looks like when you look at a WPA trace. And this is what's called the four-way handshake. If you see this EPOL key, there's four of these. And it's actually Extensible Authentication Protocol Overland Key. So if you look at it here, right here's the EPOL key, and there's four of them. One, two, three, four. And what that is, is that's called the four-way handshake. And that consists of the actual password or passphrase that the user has selected. So if I capture this four-way handshake, I can potentially crack that if it's a dictionary word or a word in a dictionary that I have when I load the tool. And WPA, as we said, WPA2, 48-bit IV, initialization vector. Authentication is 802.1x, that was that EPOL, Extensible Authentication Protocol over LAN, means the authentication goes over wired. If you're using WPA2 Enterprise, it's radius. If you're using pre-shared key, it's personal. The data encryption, TKIP, as we show there in the slide, has had flaws and been cracked. It's recommended today you always deploy WPA with AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard. There's the RSNA, the Robust Security Network Association. This is actually the 802.11i. Authentication EPOL 802.1x, supplicant wireless node, the authenticator, the access point, and the authentication server is the radius. I don't know why they use their own terminology, but they do in 802.1x. The supplicant's really a client, but this is what they have. Data encryption integrity is CCMP, AES, Advanced Encryption Standard Counter Mode Cipher Block Chaining MAC Protocol. This is the integrity of AES CCMP. So when you set your network and your wireless, if it's AES CCMP and we're trying to attack it, very difficult to attack AES. Look for WEP or WPA TKIP. Those can be attacked. Here's an example showing you again the four-way handshake I showed you once. There it is again, showing you another example of the four-way handshake with nothing intermixed in between. And remember, the extensible authentication protocol off over LAN and the four-way handshake gives me the information I need to potentially be able to crack the key. Here's an example from the DEF CON Wi-Fi shootout where they reached the 125-mile signal on the 802.11. So as you see that, they had a pretty big antenna, as you see there. He with the biggest antenna wins. That's how wireless works. Wi-Spy is an actual spectrum analyzer that can show you actually what's happening in your environment, show you different types of signals. And it's uh, from Medigeek. You go to Medigeek or look up Wi-Spy Channelizer, and you can get this, and it's a free tool. Wireless cards and capabilities. Monitor mode, as we said, promiscuous mode and wireless 
is monitor. To be able to be in monitor mode, you can't be connected. You have to have, if it's in a Windows world, Air PCAP. And within the Air PCAP driver, which is commercial from Case Technologies, you have Wireshark, you have Cascade Pilot for channel scanning, analysis, charting, and reporting. You have Kismet for network discovery, and you have Aircrack NG for web cracking. So this is how you actually set up wireless for cracking. When we do the actual demo and do wireless cracking, we will show you how to do it with Backtrack and on Unix and Linux because you don't need the Air PCAP driver unless you're doing it on a Windows environment. So for your wireless cracking, your wireless hacks, you might want to look at using Backtrack or a Unix or Linux tool. If you use Windows, you have to go purchase the Air PCAP adapter. There's the example showing you the ePoll key again. Aircrack NG. Aircrack NG is the next generation of wireless cracking tools. It will crack, it's an entire suite of tools that will crack pretty much any encryption protocol we've talked about that's had any weaknesses. And it will use a lot of different mechanisms to do it. And this is a GUI of Aircrack on Windows. IPA is another one. Access points, clients, frame types, subframe types. Again, it's another type of using a PCAP driver and using software to intercept wireless communications. Remember, wireless communications is wireless. So since it's wireless, it's coming across the wire, there's a good chance we're going to be able to intercept it and crack it if it's WEP or dictionary attack it if it's WPA, PSK, TK. This brings us to a lab. We're going to do a lab on attacking wireless.